Are you ready? Fuck yeah, I'm ready. I'm the Wolverine. Stop it. So with the Deadpool films, there's always kind of the aspirin and the applesauce, which is this serious, earnest backbone yes. amidst all the nuttiness. I want to know how important was it to you to have that core emotional through line and make sure that was set before the boys started sprinkling dick jokes? It was extremely important to all of us, especially to Ryan and to Hugh and to Sean. And you're absolutely right. And the first person who's pointed out beyond the R-rated and the crude jokes and that fun that in both of the other Deadpool movies, and, and I think particularly in this one, there is an emotional core to the character. Very much of this movie is about Deadpool saying, am I tired of my own shtick? I know I turn everything into a joke, but I care. And I want to use that for something important. And as he starts to reflect on his, on his life in this movie, which is a very relatable emotional thing for, for any uh, a movie character to go through to, to connect with the audience. I think that was always, believe it or not, much more important to everybody involved than the jokes. The jokes come naturally to Ryan and to the screenwriters and sprinkle them in as needed, which is a lot. Oh, whiskey dick of the claws. It's quite common in Wolverines over 40. You don't want this. But it is that emotional core, which you're absolutely right, is the key to this movie and what I'm most excited about people seeing will be exactly that, will be the core of how emotional and moving the story is and the relationship between those two. I know from listening to you on the Trek spurts and stuff, what a big Trek fan you are. And so like, I mean, obviously Star Trek II is amazing and it also proves that you can do a lower budget franchise movie and have it work. Like, is there a reason why we haven't gotten like a low or moderate MCU movie yet? Well, it depends on your definition of low or moderate, right? I mean, an Iron Man costs much less than, a, than an Endgame. But I do think you're right, and, 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 and Rath Khan's a great example of that. The first X-Men film is a great example of that. Uh, the first Iron Man film of limitations being helpful. We had been very lucky over the years that, um, that our success meant there weren't a lot of limitations given to us, but we have since uh, started self-imposing limitations for just that reason, including Deadpool and Wolverine. How do you find the more clever way, the more meaningful way, the more emotional way to do something while still keeping the, keeping the spectacle? After 16 years, this is the first R-rated MCU movie. And I remember uh, Mick Garris told me that uh, once that Steven Spielberg confided in him, I have so many dark ideas. I have, you know, I ideas that would make Cronenberg shudder. But I can't do them because I'm Steven Spielberg. I'm king of the feel-good blockbuster. And I'm wondering, is that a, like a sentiment that you can relate to? I'd love to see those dark ideas that <laughs> Spielberg has, first of all. No, I've never felt hindered by, by ratings on anything we've, we've done before, um, which is one of the reasons why it was agreed upon early on that Deadpool would maintain its R rating, because why put shackles on something that succeeded because it didn't have them. It is fun to tap into it, and I'm sure we will do so again when it's, a, when it's appropriate, makes sense for the character. The, the comic books have an incredible range of, of tones and, uh, and styles, and it's always been our job at Marvel Studios to translate those uh, up onto the big screen. So I'm sure there will be more, but I'm very proud that Deadpool and Wolverine, for as emotional and meaningful as the movie is, uh, is the first one. Does it bring you a sense of satisfaction to reconnect um, professionally with Hugh Jackman after all these years? It's amazing, and it, and it really is, and it was unanticipated because the rights had not been with us for so long. I just had never thought about that ever happening. So now that it has happened, it is, it is particularly meaningful, and it was a quarter of a century ago mm -hmm. that uh, we were together in, in Toronto. Um, him, the star of the movie, me, uh, one of the many uh, producerial uh, members, and now to be back together for this movie in particular and for, uh, and for uh, as emotional as the movie itself is, uh, it felt that way to us behind the scenes. Would working with the Russos again bring that same sense of satisfaction? It would, or, uh, or Sean Levy, who's rumored, or whoever's going to be rumored next week. <laughs> we'll see. In the late 90s, James Cameron very presciently stated, uh, movies are in danger of becoming fan-fucked to death. And obviously, like, we've seen studios try to course correct after perceived backlash and stuff like that. You know, how do you, as the architect of this very special universe, push back on that and say, 
you know, Eternals still have a purpose. The Marvels still have a story to tell. Let's revisit Thor The Dark World, stuff like that. Well, we did, right? We, we revisited that in Endgame in a big way with, yeah. with, uh, with a Frigga. And I think uh, that's part of the fun of what the comics have done for decades and decades is reinterpreting storylines or taking obscure, forgotten characters and bringing them back and re-evaluating re, uh, them. So anything that we've done is part of the, the tapestry now of the MCU. Uh, and I don't think one should, should hide from that, um, but, but embrace it and figure out Where's the, you know, sometimes it may take 16 years, but to find the right moment and time to, to bring it back. Beautiful. Well, thank you so thank much, you. Kevin. Thanks very much. Get the fuck off of me. Shh, shh. Almost done. Almost done what? Getting my knife out of your buttocks. Perfect. <laughs> Get your mind out of my pants. Ah!